one. Welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brook Show starts now. Happy uh, Labor Day weekend, everybody. I hope you're having a great weekend, and I've got some uh, exciting plans uh, for, for the weekend. Me, I'm... Uh, I am off to Europe uh, tomorrow. I'm off for a speaking, uh, speaking tour of, uh, of Europe. Going to be in a bunch of uh, different countries, some you might have not even heard of. Uh, it, it should be interesting. And uh, I'll actually be doing some of the shows from Europe. So, um, you know, you'll hear on some of my experiences uh, traveling over there. I'm hoping uh, if, you know, if, internet, if the Internet gods are with us, then we should have a show from uh, Baku, Azerbaijan, uh, which should be really interesting. Uh, my first time ever there in, uh, in Baku. So, uh, uh, and uh, the following week, hopefully, will be from, um, from Geneva, Switzerland. So uh, a little bit more, I guess, uh, civilized. I don't know if, if, if it's politically correct to say that. But, uh, but yeah, I think, I think legitimately we can say that. All right, so... Um, I'm off. I'm off on an airplane uh, starting uh, today. Actually, after the show, um, I'm uh, packing up, finishing up all my packing, and uh, off I go. I'll be in Europe three weeks and in uh, New York for one week, and I'll be giving talks and doing events in uh, in all those places. Just in case we have some European listeners, if you're in London or Tbilisi or Baku, Paris, Geneva. Copenhagen or Kiev, I'm doing events in any one of, in, in, in all of those places, uh, not Germany this time, so any one of those places. Uh, hopefully, uh, it, you know, you can, uh, you can easily find information about uh, the different talks. It's on my Facebook page. Just go to uh, facebook.com at ybrook. I'll also be posting stuff on Twitter. That's Yaron Brook, Y-A-R-O-N Brook uh, on Twitter. And uh, so Whitebrook, Y-B-R-O-O-K on Facebook. And uh, you should be able to access all the events there. You can also get it at einrand.org slash events. So einrand.org slash events. There'll be a listing of all the events I'll be doing from um, my first event in London to I think I'm doing four events in Tbilisi all the way to the last event in, uh, in Kiev. And then in New York, I will be uh, doing a debate at Yale which I think is going to be live streamed. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to, 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 to catch that. It's, uh, I'll, I'll post on Facebook and Twitter information about the live debate uh, at, at Yale. That'll be at the end of September, towards the end of September, I think the 27th of September. And then the Ayn Rand Institute hosts an Atlas Shrugged uh, celebration dinner uh, every year. And this, uh, this year it's on the 28th of September at the uh, St. Regis Hotel in New York City, you're all invited. It, it costs. It's a it's a charity fundraiser, so it costs some money. But you can uh, you can find that by going again to the Ayn Rand Institute website and looking at the events, or by searching uh, Atlas Shrugged Revolution Dinner on um, on on Google, and uh, you will find the registration and everything else. So uh, a lot going on. In the next four weeks, I'm busy as hell and, uh, you know, all over the place, all over the world. And, uh, but I'll be broadcasting from there. So uh, broadcasting from, as I said, Baku, uh, Geneva, and, uh, and uh, one from, uh, from New York. So um, I guess let's get on with the show. We'll, we'll, we'll see kind of what topics uh, come up uh, while I'm traveling. And, uh, you know, I'll give you some of my experiences uh, from being on the road. And some of the things going on in these uh, distant countries, distant places that, uh, I, you know, some of them, uh, Baku I've never been to, Azerbaijan I've never been to, uh, Tbilisi I've been to before, but I've only been once. It should be interesting. Geneva is not a place I've spent a lot of time with in, so um, it should be interesting. And I've never really, I've given one talk in, in Paris, but I've, I've never really done any kind of major events in Paris so Paris should be interesting just in terms of that. And then we've got a major free speech event in Copenhagen with uh, Fleming Rose that I'm doing. Uh, Fleming Rose is the guy who published the Danish cartoons in 2005, sparked all those riots all over the world. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, 
free speech and how, how to live, how, how, how we structure societies in a world it, where people um, get offended by much of what's being said and, uh, you know, what's, what's the right approach in a multicultural world. Um, what are the principles by which we can survive and thrive? What are the principles by which we can live, survive, and thrive? So uh, that, that should be fascinating. That's in Copenhagen at, at the Parliament. And then I'll be in Kiev doing a couple of things, as I said, one, one of which is a, uh, a talk for students, and the other um, is I'm, I'm teaching a class, three-hour class in the executive MBA program at the Kiev Business School, three hours of, um, you know, almost like a radio show, but teaching these relatively senior executives, uh, Ukrainian executives uh, in, in business in Ukraine. That should be, that should be, um, that should be a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of fun. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to a great trip, and uh, hopefully I'll fill you in as the trip as the trip goes along, um, and uh, all right, all right. Let's start today with a discussion Oops. Uh, about uh, what's going on in North Korea. Obviously, that's in the news. That's in the headlines. We we've got a lot uh, a lot going on in terms of um, you know they 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 detonated another nuclear nuclear bomb. Uh, they claim it's a hydrogen bomb. I've read some analysis from experts that suggest no. It's it's only an atomic bomb. It is a um, it is a powerful atomic bomb. It's more powerful than the one that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and not quite uh, probably uh, ten times more powerful than the bombs that they uh, tried uh, before. So it's it's a, a, a very substantial increase over uh, previously, and that we can measure because we can measure the seismic reactions of the of the test. So we know they actually did. Uh, explode an atomic bomb that it actually happened and uh you know the other claims that the experts are making again how to verify how to tell if they know what they're talking about is that they do have the technology now to put a bomb on a tip of a icbm of a missile and launch such a missile if not hit california certainly probably hit alaska tokyo and certainly hit south korea so uh our allies uh, countries that we have defense agreements with uh, under threat of nuclear attack from uh, North Korea, and so is the United States. I mean, w we we think that California is out of range, but who knows? Who knows what they actually have? Now, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute because I'm always suspicious about claims of technology from these authoritarian regimes. My experience, my experience with um, weapons from the old Soviet Union was that they were pathetic that they were always hyped as being cutting edge, best, of, best in the world, very, very dangerous, better than what the West has. And they always turned out to be pathetic. And I suspect that the weapons that North Korea has are pretty pathetic. I suspect that the missile technology is far more primitive than what they claim or what even the experts claim. Experts always overestimate the power of our enemies. Um, but... I want to do, I want to talk, uh, we're going to take a break in a little bit, but I, after the break, what I want to do is I want to talk you through what I think, you know, you're getting, we're getting very little information about what, what are the military options that the United States actually has <clears throat> in North Korea. And it's really fascinating to me because in the era of soundbite television, in the era of Fox and CNN and quick and three minute interviews and stuff, you can't really get into what a military campaign in North Korea would look like, what are the risks, uh, what can be achieved, what are the dangers, which is unfortunate because I think most Americans' experience with war uh, recently is uh, is Iraq or, or the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, the second Gulf War, Afghanistan, which are very, very different types of wars than what you would have to engage in in North Korea. And the risks and the threats are very different, and yet Americans don't know it. And yet they're, they're continuously being surveyed, should we go to war with North Korea? But they have no clue. They're ignorant. And I suspect, without knowing all of you, that most of you are, are ignorant about the situation in North Korea, unless you've read some in-depth articles, unless you've invested some time in actually examining and evaluating what's going on. It's very hard to tell what's going on in, uh, in North Korea. So 
What I want to do, we're going to take a, a quick break right now. What I want to do when we get back to the break is break it down for you a little bit, right? I'm not going to go into a, a million details, and I'm not an expert, uh, uh, you know, uh, on this. I've, I've read my fair share of in-depth articles. I know a little bit about military operations, but I certainly am no uh, expert on North Korea and don't have any uh, specialized intelligence information uh, about North Korea, but but there's some obvious things that are not being mentioned that I'm not seeing that need to be addressed, that need to be talked about, and uh, we will do that after this break. You're listening to the Iran Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network, and we'll be back soon. This is the Iran Book Show. All right, so we're talking about North Korea, and we're talking about you know they just uh, they just did this. Uh, 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 another test of their nuclear capabilities. They blew up a weapon, and um, so uh, and it was powerful, more powerful than the previous ones they've done. So they they clearly have the capacity uh, to blow up a nuclear device. Uh, still a question about whether they can put it onto a missile, uh, but they they certainly have the missiles. Uh, they they flew a missile last week over within in Japanese airspace over Japan, and uh, they certainly have. The capacity to, you know, so the, we don't know if they have the capacity to put it on a missile. They have missile capacity, they have nuclear bombs. Can they merge them? But that's just a matter of time. If they don't have it yet, they will have it. And, and the real question is still, what, if anything, should the United States do? And, and, and um, let's, let, let's set up, let's set this up first in terms of the challenges that we face. Then I want to talk about how we got into the situation because it's, it's, it's pathetic that we're even facing this situation. And then uh, what actually can be done? So let's start by the fact that South Korea, which is uh, you know part of uh, what I would consider the Western world, a uh, rich, uh, relatively free country, and that is an ally of the United States. We actually have troops in South Korea, and you could argue whether that's justifiable or not. I would say not, but but we have troops there. We have a defense alliance with them. But South Korea is the largest city, Seoul, South Korea. I was actually there uh, this last spring in June. I was in Seoul. Seoul, South Korea is a, is a, is a massive city of, of millions and millions of people. And um, Seoul, South Korea is obviously the largest city in South Korea. It is uh, full of uh, skyscrapers and condo buildings and houses and homes. And, and just, it just millions and millions of people live there. Seoul is 25 miles from the border, basically 25 miles from North Korean artillery. In addition uh, to that, North Korea's artillery is then 25, is set up depth-wise, 25 miles deep into North Korean territory. So there's some artillery right there on the border, some artillery a few miles back, all the way back to 25 miles. And they have thousands of pieces of artillery, thousands of pieces of artillery, all facing Seoul, all that can reach Seoul. So let's say we decided to take out the, the, uh, the nuclear capabilities of the North Koreans. And let's say we could take out the North, the, the, which is a question. I have no idea if we can or cannot. My assumption is we, you could certainly with a nuke. But uh, maybe with bunker buster bombs, you could get most of their nukes and you could destroy them. But let's let's say let's say you could do that. You could take uh, the estimate is they have thirty bombs. Let's say you could take all thirty bombs out. Then you've got to deal with artillery because artillery immediately is turned on, and it would flatten Seoul. You would have hundreds of thousands of casualties. Hundreds of thousands of casualties. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm making some assumptions here. One assumption is that the artillery works, and, and I'll get to that. But, but assuming the artillery works, and you have to make that assumption at least initially, hundreds of thousands of casualties on the ground in Seoul, maybe into the millions, given the firepower that North Korea has, even without its nuclear weapons, all targeted at this major city, a, a city that does not have... Uh, uh, expansive bomb shelters that does not have the capability to shield millions of people. And you're not a city you're not going to evacuate in advance of a U.S. strike. Uh, 
there is, there's no clear path um, given that. So you've got this. Now, some would say, well, why doesn't the U.S. take out the artillery? Well, one, because there's so much of it. There's just such a huge quantity of that artillery. Second is that all over North Korea, uh, but particularly along the border, the North Koreans have what is called a, um, uh, it's a, it's a ground-to-air missile protection. Something like what, uh, the Russian equivalent of uh, what's called the S-300, or what in the, uh, the U.S. version is called the Patriot system. These are very sophisticated systems that are supposed to knock airplanes out of the sky, that make it extraordinarily difficult to fly, uh, to fly missions and to take out the actual artillery that is, that is pointed at Seoul, South Korea. So you've got, you've got a real problem here, right? They've already got a bomb, right? They've already got a bomb. Um, they've got thousands of artillery pieces pointing at your major city. I don't know that we know where all the bombs are. They also have, uh, you know, they have an air defense system that is based on, you know, Soviet technology, uh, world class or, or, or top of the line. And it's difficult to neutralize all of that all at once. So any attack by the U.S. on North Korea is going to have to assume massive tens, if not hundreds of thousands of casualties on the South Korean side. And the question, of course, is what is South Korea's view of this? I mean, we would be, uh, they are an ally. You, we would supposedly be coordinating all of this with the South Koreans. They are the most likely people to, uh, to, to feel the brunt of this. So we're in a situation where it really is disastrous. Now, you can imagine, you could, you could come up with military scenarios that, uh, that could deal with this, at least to some extent. Uh, hugely risky, and I still think the South Koreans would have to uh, sign off on it, but you would have to take into account, you would have to assess whether these... Uh, whether the risks associated with these scenarios justify, um, you know, or whether, whether the, the, the benefits of these scenarios justify the risk. And so even if, even if and, and of course, you, you're always, the other risk is that China gets involved. But let's assume, let's put China aside. Let's assume China doesn't really want to get involved and doesn't want this. Um, what do you do? What do you do? All right. So I, when I get back, I want to talk about a little bit about, you know, some scenarios that might be possible um, to execute on that, but would be extraordinarily difficult. What some alternatives in terms of what one would do are, and then finally, I want to talk about how we got into this mess. One what minute. can what we can learn from it, and how do we prevent getting into a mess like this in the future? Now, I'm pretty convinced that we have learned nothing from it. I'm pretty convinced that we will do nothing about what, what is happening or that we do the wrong things. But, you know, that's where we are. So, uh, I, you know, we certainly need to think about this as it applies to Iran. Uh, we certainly need to think about this uh, as it applies to other countries that 30. might at some point develop these kind of capabilities and, and pose this kind of risk. All right. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about this. You can call in 888-900-3393 if you have an opinion about North Korea. You're listening to the Yaron Brook Show on the Blaze Radio Network, and you can hear us here live every Sunday. Ten. The Yaron Brook Show. All right, so we're talking about North Korea, and we're talking about their nuclear capabilities. We're talking about what they could do to South Korea, whether they can hit the United States or not. I think at this point is mostly speculation. They could probably hit Japan, although how accurate their missiles are and, and the actual ability to hit Japan is, again, questionable. What they certainly can do is devastate South Korea. I mean, devastate South Korea. And look, I mean, my temptation is always to say if there's a war in some godforsaken place across on the other side of the globe is let it happen. It's not a risk to the United States. If they want to fight it out, let them fight it out. I believe that the United States military should only be used, only be used 
when the U.S. is threatened, when the lives and property of Americans are threatened. I don't believe in going out and building democracies. I don't believe in going out and defending democracies. I don't think we should be in NATO. I don't think we should be defending Eastern Europe right now or Western Europe. And I ultimately do not think we should be in South Korea or Japan. I think those countries are rich enough to be able to afford their own militaries. This is the one thing Donald Trump said on the campaign trail that I actually agreed with. They're rich enough to defend themselves. They're rich enough to build themselves navies and armies and, and capabilities to defend themselves. Americans shouldn't die so that Japan can stay free. Sorry. But we have treaties. We have defense agreements. We have committed certain things. Whether I agree with them or not, they are in existence today. We cannot ignore the fact that we have a defense agreement with Japan and South Korea. We cannot just launch into a, into a war with North Korea or not launch into a war with North Korea. We can't make these decisions unilaterally at this point because we have agreements. Now, we could withdraw from those agreements, and I think we should, but I don't think we should do it right now because if we do right now, that would be perceived strongly as a sign of weakness by the North Koreans, and weakness is always leads to aggression. So uh, if they actually thought we were weak, they would come after us. And I don't want us to be and be perceived as weak. So I think we need to resolve in one way the North Korean situation and then tell the South Koreans and the, North, and, and the Japanese that they, over the next, let's say, five years, 10 years, we undo the treaty and that they have to build up their own militaries to defend themselves. Again, rich countries, they have enough population. Uh, you know, if you compare South Korea to North Korea, uh, South Korea is a much larger population and much, much, much richer. Much richer. Do you know, just as an aside, that at the end of the Korean War, end of the Korean War, South Korea was poorer than North Korea. South Korea was poorer than North Korea. So they would do, I mean, they were as poor as any, as, as an African country is today. And today, they are, you know, a million times, you know, not a million times, but, you know, thousands of times richer than, uh, than the North Koreans. It's, it really is unbelievable, the difference. And if you want an illustration of the, of the differences between capitalism, even tried on a minute scale like it was in South Korea, and, um, and, and communism, then you've got to write Dana Peninsula. It, it, it's, it's truly unbelievable why anybody, why not everybody sees it and sees the, how obvious it is. All right, so let's, let's dream up some scenarios for an actual military action just for fun. Uh, in, uh, so remember, I, I, you know, my primary concern is that it, the defense is what I see as the main role of the United States, which is to protect the individual rights of Americans. Now, because we have these defense treaties, you have to protect South Koreans as well. That, that's in the treaty. So as long as we have it, we have to do it. So how would you avoid massive civilian casualties in South Korea? So I would, I would do it this way. And again, I'm not proposing this because I think at the end of the day, it's too soon for military action given where we are today. I would do this. You would have to have a, a very sophisticated joint attack, and you would have to do this stealthily, which is hard. Uh, you would have to build up the forces over time, which is hard because the North Koreans monitor everything we do. But you would have to engage in a massive first strike that was so devastating that the North Koreans couldn't respond. And then you would rely on the fact that the North Koreans' weapons and technology and infrastructure probably would collapse. It probably would not be able to sustain the kind of damage that everybody predicts because it's just built in North Korea or in the Soviet Union, or in Russia or whatever. It's, it's, it's just not very good. So you would have to, you would have to launch, I think, a three-prong attack. One, you would have to take out the North Korean leadership, all of them, starting from the top down. Now, notice that America does not do that anymore. There's actually, I think, a, a, a bill that was passed in the 70s that prohibits the United States from targeting, uh, from targeting uh, the uh, leaders of other countries. So I don't know if that's even legal. Maybe we'd have to change the law. But target the entire leadership structure from the, 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 the dictator on down to the generals to his 
cousins and nephews and uncles and and uh, and their families you just you you'd have to wipe them out you'd have to do it in such a way that you know the entire leadership structure was as much of it was wiped out now some would survive and because they're probably spread out in the probably so you'd have to have great intelligence on where they are where they live uh, and you would have to do it now I, I would probably you would probably have to put some special forces on the ground to achieve some of this you would have to probably work with special forces from South Korea to do this um, who know the language and who can blend into the population there it would not be easy but it is doable uh, special forces and and, uh, and an airstrike combined to, to basically just crush the entire leadership at the same time you would have to launch a devastating attack on whatever nuclear facilities you thought that these people had but it would have to be timed perfectly so that you killed the leadership just a little before you launched this attack so they could not order a counter-strike and at the same time now, luckily, these are different types of bombers. These are different types of planes that would be engaged. You would have to launch a massive, massive attack on the artillery uh, along the uh, South Korean border. And this would have to be a, mainly from the air, but also you would have to then invade with ground troops. And I assume that the primary ground troops would have to be South Korean. There's some American troops there, but just not enough. Now, all of this would have to be negotiated in my view in advance or, 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 or somehow you would have to cut a deal with the Chinese not to intervene. Now the way to cut a deal with the Chinese not to intervene, this is how I would do it. Um, I would guarantee to them that when it is over, right, when it is over, the United States will rescind the defense treaty with South Korea and withdraw all troops and American weapons from the South, from the Korean Peninsula. So you want the reunification, the, the uni, unification of Korea, but you don't want it to be perceived by the Chinese as a threat. And therefore, the United States need to be out of there. And that, that would move us towards a world which I think is better, where the United States is not guarantee, guaranteeing the security of these countries. At the same time, you tell the Chinese you'll do the same thing with Japan. That will, I think, uh, uh, if they believed us, I think that would guarantee that the Chinese not intervene, All right? So that would be my war scenario, right? As as a uh, you know, as a amateur former uh, former first sergeant in the Israeli military intelligence, for whatever that's worth, and uh, someone a student of history and a student of war, uh, that would be how I would do it. I still think you would you would have to take significant casualties uh, of civilians. I'm not talking about military casualties. I think, I, and I also think. You could wipe out the North Korean uh, military very quickly. I think those weapons are old. I don't think they're functional. I think the, the soldiers are unmotivated. What exactly are they dying for? I think most of them would run. Most of them would surrender. I think it could be quick. I think it could be devastating. And I think you would win. All right? I think you would win. Um, I would not ask anybody's permission. I would not take this to the United Nations. The only country I would have... Any discussions with is China and, and probably only after I started bombing and only to guarantee to them that I would leave, that I would not, that the treaties would be gone and that Korea would be on its own after this threat was taken care of. That would be my military strategy. I'm sure they're going to be uh, military strategists out there who uh, critique it. And of course, you can critique it if you disagree with me, 888 nine zero zero three three nine three now when i come back i want to talk about why i don't think that's what we should do uh even though it's doable i also want to talk about how we got into this situation uh not a lot of time to cover all that but we are going to try you're listening to your own book show on the blaze radio network and we'll be back after this break <laughs> All right, you're listening to Iran Book Show, the only place where you actually get facts and analysis and not just superficial, quick, uh, sound-bitey political commentary. I'm not talking about, you know, some people in the chat are saying, I'm not talking about appeasing the Chinese. Nothing about appeasing the Chinese. Let them know that they shouldn't intervene. You don't want to get into a, a, a nuclear standoff with the Chinese. 
that they shouldn't intervene, and that you're doing these things in American self-interest. You're going to crush the North Koreans, and then you're going to leave and leave it to the South Koreans and to Japan to defend itself. That is where I want to be anyway. So it's not a matter of appeasement. It's a matter of moving in the most rational way to where we should be anyway. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think any of this is going to happen because I don't think uh, I don't think our military, our commanders, I don't think our military, um, and I, I don't think uh, uh, any any of the people uh, you know involved today in decision making in the United States and the president down have the courage, the courage to actually do this or have the the brains or the knowledge or the or the know how to do it because you know they're so afraid of civilian casualties and they're so afraid of not upsetting anybody and they're so afraid of the, the consequences they're not willing to actually do anything and, and 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 the fact is it's a very risky it's a very risky scenario so here's an alternative i still don't think they'll do the alternative but here's my alternative to this my alternative would be to prepare for such an attack to put the aircraft carriers in place to put the bombers in place to put uh, everything you need in place um and then Every time the North Koreans launch anything, you knock it down. Uh, so we should build up our air defense systems. We should build up our anti-missile systems. And we should knock down everything that they put up and knock it down faster than anybody else could. Right? Faster than anyone else could. And... Um, let the North Koreans know that you now have the capacity to destroy them. Let the North Koreans know that the first target is the leadership and that if they actually start a, a shelling South Korea or start anything like that, start a war, that they will be devastated instantaneously, quickly, effectively. And uh, if you do that, if you, if you put all the resources and start knocking down their missiles, maybe you have a chance. Now, in addition... You've got to cut them off completely. I, I don't see why we don't have a naval blockade of North Korea. Uh, why we don't we start searching ships before they get there. Uh, one of the reasons to do that is the danger of them exporting their nuclear missiles and nuclear technology. We know they worked with Syrians to try to develop a nuclear bomb. That's what the Israelis took out a few years ago, was the plant that the North Koreans and Syrians were building together. But part of that is shipping materials out. we, we got to stop that. You've got to starve them. So I would, I would try anything short of war because I think war, um, in this case, is so, so, so risky. And uh, the fact is, you know, I don't think that the South Koreans are going to launch a nuclear attack on the United States. But I don't want to put a, a crazy man in a position where he has the capability of blackmailing us, which is what I think he would do. And, and most presidents of the United States would fold under such blackmail. So I, I don't trust the political leaders. Let me just say quickly how we got here. We really got here by, by, because of Two the minutes. mistakes made during the Korean War. The biggest mistake during the Korean War was intervening in it. What did the United States have to go to Korea for? This was a United Nations war. We should never get involved in United Nations war. We should have troops affiliated with the United Nations. We should never, ever have gone. And then we wouldn't have troops there. And then South Korea, unfortunately, would have probably be ca uh, captured by the communists. It would be one big communist country, and it would probably be safer for us to actually defend ourselves against a threat coming from them rather than have... Now, it's sad for South Koreans, but that's not our job. Our job is not to defend South Koreans. Our job is not to enhance South Korea. Now, once we went into the Korean War, the job of the military was to win it. And of course, there, Truman was the coward. Uh, uh, Truman refused to listen to um, General MacArthur on how to win that war. That war was One winnable. Uh, it might have required use of nuclear weapons, but it was winnable. And then you would have had an entire Korean peninsula that was free. So either of those two scenarios were better than what we got. Right? From an American perspective, not from a Korean perspective. Korean perspective, certainly the second scenario is much better. But we should have never been in that war any more than we should have been in the Vietnam War. You know, it's sad if communism would have taken over all Korea, but we would have survived just like America survived the fact that at the end of the day, 
all of Vietnam was taken over by communists. You know, not pleasant, not nice, but survivable. And then, of course, we've appeased the North Koreans over and over and over again before they had nukes and allowed them to develop them. And that is the great tragedy from Clinton 10. to Obama. They failed. All right, you're listening to the Iran Book Show. We'll be back Five. after this. News. Welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brooks Show starts now. All right, so we're talking about, we've been talking about North Korea. I want to I wanna spend maybe a few minutes here just wrapping up some things on North Korea. And then uh, after the next break, uh, we're going to switch topics and talk about another set of... Uh, authoritarians uh, but this one domestic called Antifa so let's let's just wrap up a few clean up a few things about North Korea let's be clear my view is that the only role of the American military is to protect America it's to protect the lives and property of Americans I don't believe engaging in wars overseas in order to stop the spread of communism in order to stop the spread of fill in the blank if somebody's a threat to the United States a real threat then crush them destroy them don't fight proxy wars. I, so I'm against the one Korea. It should have never happened. That peninsula, unfortunately, would have become all communist. But Soviet Vietnam is, is that way today. And Vietnam is not a threat to the United States. Uh, so who knows what would have happened? Who knows? You probably wouldn't have had this particular family ruling over the entire Korea. They would have been, it, it's a bigger, more, more complicated story if that would have happened. If you go to war, win it. Right, so if you go to war in Korea, which we did in the in uh, in the late '40s, early '50s, win it, whatever it takes, win it. That would have created a peninsula that was all free. That would wouldn't have been a problem. So all these problems are problems of history of not winning wars. And I would argue that today, the threat that Iran poses to the United States, and if it ever develops nuclear weapons and then uses them to blackmail the United States, then we will go back and say. That it was uh, the, the lack, the, the fact that the United States did not respond to the taking of its embassy in 1979. It was the fact that the United States let the Iranian off the hook post 9-11. It's the fact that the United States has not dealt with Iran over and over and over again when it needed dealing with that will lead to the negative outcome maybe decades from now. Who knows? Hopefully not. Hopefully there'll be an internal revolution in Iran and everything will be settled. But there is a certain likelihood that that doesn't happen, that really, really bad stuff comes out of Iran because of our weakness, because of our weakness over all these decades of not dealing with a real viable threat and our winning wars when we engage with them. We've been at war with Iran since 1979. The taking of our, of our, of our embassy is a war. All right. In North Korea, somebody asked, would you do, how would you deal with the Russians? I don't deal with the Russians. The Russians not going to intervene. Russia is too weak. People think of Russia as strong. Russia is weak and poor. Russia does not have the military capability to, to intervene. And uh, it, 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 is, it is busy in Ukraine. It has an Islamist threat. Russia has its hands full. I mean, Putin plays a... I wouldn't want to play poker with the guy because he over... You know, he, he, he has a very weak hand. And yet everybody in the world is terrified of him in spite of his very weak hand. So I'm not worried about, I'm much more worried about China. But again, I wouldn't appease China. I would just notify them that this is what's going to happen. So, uh, and in terms of trade, I would blockade. I would do everything, any company that trades with them, I would do no business with. That would hurt the Chinese, but I would not stop all trade with China because of what's going on with North Korea. I would target it to specific organizations, specific entities. And I'm going to have to do a show about trade with China and how to deal with trade with China because there's a lot of issues with trade with China. On the one hand, it is a great win-win. On the other hand, there are things that you have to address when you're dealing with the Chinese. And the, the, the number, one is North Korea, and second is uh, the infringement of property rights, of intellectual property rights. So you have to have a policy. You have to have a strategy of dealing with the Chinese with regard to property rights, intellectual property rights, and with regard to North Korea, which would limit how much trade you did with them. All right, that's all I really want to talk about North Korea. At the end of the day, 
I, I, you know, this is going to be in the headlines a lot, but the discussion uh, mostly is going to be pretty superficial and stupid. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background. Hopefully you are better educated so you can now better assess what is going on uh, with regard to South, South Korea and North Korea and what are America's true interests. Uh, remember that the weapons of bad guys are, are, are almost always less efficient and less effective than what is believed. Maybe, uh, you know, with the exception of uh, the Nazis during World War II, and even there, they ultimately failed. So um, I'm not overly worried about North Korea, even though I live in Southern California, which is supposed to be the target of their nuclear bomb. And by the way, nuclear war is always is, is a disaster. So to the extent, uh, you know, millions and millions of people would die on our side if you got into a real exchange. That's why you have to, in whatever war you engage in, destroy nuclear capabilities first. That has to be the primary priority. All right, we're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, we're going to talk about the threat from within, Antifa. You're listening to your Ron Brooks show on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right back. Claire? 